Welcome back, Shalligators. Today, we're going to talk about two celebs that I don't think we've ever spoken about here because they're kind of like, oh yeah, you guys. They're not really on our radar. Comedian John Mulaney and actress Olivia Munn. Why are we talking about them? Well, John is like the best comedian, male comic, because Eliza Schlesinger is best overall. We know this. We know this. But John is right up there for dudes. He's the best. <clears throat> he recently got out of rehab and promptly divorced his wife and then took up with Olivia, like literally days after the news broke of his divorce. News also broke that he's dating Olivia Munn. So we're going to talk about this from two different angles. We're going to talk about this from his ex, soon to be ex-wife's point of view of like standing by a guy when things are going bad for him and the pros and cons of that. But we're also going to look at this from Olivia's point of view. When the hot chick goes after the nerd. If you're finding yourself crushing on like the guy who's like not really like Mr. Socially Cool, like maybe not the hottest dude out there. I'm going to tell you the pros and cons of this and one major pitfall to look out for because you won't see it coming until it's too late. But before we get started, I want to give you guys the 411 on a collab I did with mom-daughter duo James Lauren Beauty. They reached out to me and wanted to do a collaboration, a look for my new house. And so we came up with a design that is, I think, just so chic and so beautiful because quilts, when you think of quilts, you think of this like hillbilly fever dream, right? No, 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 this is not what these are. Heavy like a weighted blanket, it's almost 12 pounds, but it's really fluffy and squishy like a duvet. So it's like the best of both worlds and it's huge. It makes a fantastic baby gift, a wedding gift, just a gift for yourself because you deserve to be cozy no matter what. So click the link in the bio to go ahead and shop. And like I said, you're gonna be supporting a really adorable mom, daughter, and black owned brand that makes some really incredible products. So, okay, let's get started with John and Olivia. Okay, first we gotta take this back. <clears throat> Let's talk about this from his ex-wife's point of view. So like I said, he completed a two month rehab stint. I think in, he got out in February. Two months is a long time. He was in there for Coke and alcohol. There's a saying in comedy that a good comic looks at the world and sees everything funny, but a great comic doesn't. Really good comedians, there's like a darkness in there. Not even necessarily always a darkness, but just a subversion. Like they don't just see the world as like, ha, 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 like a laugh a minute. They're seeing the underside of things. That's why they're insightful and incisive. You know, Eliza's like, well, I love her. She's my girl. But John's comedy is like, I don't even think of it as dark. He, he's a very clean comic and his, oh my God, his bits. I remember going to a show of his because my friend was opening my friend Nassim, hi baby, was just doing a little uh, a little quick set before his. And when John came on, like during his set, I remember I was laughing so hard. I was like, I'm going to throw up. Like, this is it. I'm going to throw up. I'm going to like projectile throw up in public. I'm My body was like going to shut down. I, I've i never laughed that hard in my life. The bit about the birthday sign, the happy birthday sign, a big ass H. Oh my God. It's so true. He's brilliant. And he, clearly though, he's one of those comics who's got some issues going on. And he's been married for six years, went to rehab. And basically the first order of business when he got out was to divorce his wife. And she just put out like the saddest statement. She's like, I'm heartbroken that John has decided to end our marriage. Oh. <sighs> And I, I appreciate her vulnerability. It's not one of these typical Hollywoods, like, we're committed to being friends, respect our private. No, she's like, no, I, I'm heartbroken. He's ending this marriage. I don't want this. And that's just like, oh my gosh. So I'm saying this because Anna Marie seems like the kind of woman who married for life. And this is her life partner. She seems like the kind of girl who is a ride or die for her husband. And I'm saying this because when we commit to someone, when we plug into someone, we run the risk of codependence. What is codependency? We hear that word all the time, codependency. To be codependent, it's defined as basically, I care more about your problems than you care about them. I want to fix you more than you want to fix you. That's codependency. It is the sacrifice of ourselves in service <clears throat> of fixing this person or this child, or this friend, or this sibling, or this parent. The codependency comes in a million different forms. And I've spoken a lot about my previous codependency. Like Max, my ex-boyfriend, and I were very codependent. I was like, in like, I was foaming at the mouth all the time, like trying to fix him and his problems. And, and that codependence created a lot of tension. And I think it really torpedoed our relationship. I mean, because it creates a parent-child dynamic, right? Your mom 
I told you not to do this. Do you really want to get this? Ba, 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 ba. It's like you're hammering them on fixing their issues. They interpret it as like nagging. She's so oppressive. This isn't fun anymore. This isn't sexy. Like it just, it creates this divide, divide, divide. Parent-child dynamics are incredibly bad. For one, parents and children don't sleep together. It's not a sexy dynamic. And two, <clears throat> the structure of a parent-child dynamic, a real one, is that the child inevitably grows up, rebels against the parent, and leaves. And when we've been in that dynamic with someone, whether it's a friend or a boyfriend, we see that too. It's like, she's not listening to me. I'm trying to help her. And it's like, she's just doing it more. It's like, she's just getting worse, right? Have we not said that to ourselves and just want to tear our hair out? Max and I are able though now to be really good friends because I have, I have worked, we both done a lot of work on ourselves, but <clears throat> on my part, I've done a lot of work on my codependent tendencies. And when I feel myself getting like, just like, no, you should do this. No, I'm going to tell you what to do. Mm, mm, mm. Not my circus, not my monkey. Not my circus, not my monkey. Oh, I'm here for you as a friend. I'm listening. I'm offering my feedback, but I'm learning when to let it go. So I'm willing to bet that Anna Marie Tendler, Anna Marie, you're putting too much sauce on the, come on. You got the, too much sauce on there. You know that, that it messes up the ratio with the cheese. Come on, Nana taught you better. I like, to, I like to think that's how she talks. I don't think it is, but I like to think it is. Is she Jewish? I feel like she's Jewish. Okay, I can't, I can't do a, a, like a Yiddish grandmother accent, but I'll work on it. Anyway, um, I feel like she was very invested in helping her husband. I mean, it's her husband, right? But this is the problem. On one hand, of course we want to plug into our partners, our boyfriend, our husband, and help them. Like, isn't that what partnership is? But at some point, a tipping point occurs. And that is when you get the therapist-patient dynamic. Ooh, it's even worse than the parent-child dynamic. When you start to fall into the therapist role for a guy, well, let me tell you, I've been researching this and I looked up the DSM-5 and here's what's going on and how it relates to your childhood and your relationship with your father. You know what there isn't on Pornhub? A channel for therapy fantasies. Because no guy has them. Guys don't wanna sleep with their therapist. Guys go to a therapist and pour out their heart, pour out what they view as their weaknesses, right? And they pay this person to never speak of it again. When we take on that role, we become a repository. We become a mirror, a reflection of everything that's wrong with him. We become a human embodiment of the worst parts of a guy. Now, is this fair? No, no. We're trying to help. I'm trying to help you. I'm I'm literally just trying to help you. They don't see it that way because men are ruled by their egos, right? And they're also ruled by their cowardice, quite frankly, and their pathological need not to be seen as the bad guy. So if you have been dating a guy or you're with someone who's, let's say, an alcoholic, right? The natural line of thought is I'm going to help him get sober. I'm going to help him stick on the path. He's going to go to rehab. I'm going to be waiting for him when he gets out. He's going to be so appreciative. He's going to just love me so much for the work I've done for him. You know what actually happens? He gets out, he's clean and sober. He looks at you, he's like, I'll never forget what you've done for me. But, oh, I met somebody, bye. Because again, you are this embodiment of the worst time in his life. If he's truly ready to start over, honey, you're out the door too. You're part of that baggage he wants to get rid of. He wants to start over with someone who doesn't know that he used to shotgun white claws at 6 a.m. until he blacked out by 8.30. He, he wants a totally fresh start. And again, this goes back to his need to not be the bad guy. Because if you were there during all of the worst times, he realizes or he believes he will never be able to apologize enough to you. You will always see him as this broken person. And so he's going to be in the doghouse forever. So no matter how clean and sober he might be, you're always going to view him as this fuck up. You're always going to be like having him sort of in a timeout, never really trusting him. The past will never die. He will never move forward as long as you're around. And I believe this is what happened with John Mulaney and his wife. He's ready to turn the page. She's on that page. So the question is like, well, so would I just like abandon all hope from like my boyfriend, my partner? Am I just like, cool story, Hansel. Like if they're going through something, no. But we have to learn when and how to help in a way that's constructive rather than destructive to us. Because you don't wanna be building up a man for the next woman while he's tearing you down for the next guy, right? 
He's going to move on whole and great and worthy and just all unbroken. And you have just emptied your entire self out to fix him at the expense of yourself. And what what you get from this? Is there actually a Captain save -a ranking in the Special Forces of the United States? Oh, there's not? Oh. Is there any sort of like cash payout? No, also no. Interesting. You know what we think we're going to get? A lifetime of loyalty. Men are not rescue dogs. They're not. You rescue a pit bull, rehab him, get him to trust you. Yeah, he will like rip out someone's trachea to defend you. Men are not as good as dogs. We know this. So we have to learn the line between I'm here for you, I'm being supportive, but this is your journey. I talked about this in previous videos with like Justin Bieber and Haley Baldwin. And that's what she did. She took a massive step back from him when she realized he was super fucked up in like 2016. Remember, he was just on his bullshit. <clears throat> She's like, cool, fix yourself. I'll see you. I'll see you when I see you. She said that they stayed in touch, but she massively removed herself from that. She didn't try to play the therapist. She played cheerleader. And you know what? No one passes the cheerleader the ball. Deshaun and James are not being like, go deep to Brittany, pass it to Caitlin over on the sideline. Yeah, give it to Hannah, run it over to Lauren. No one's doing that. The cheerleaders are there. Yeah, you can do it. Oh, you didn't? Oh, that sucks. It's, well, no, don't, don't pass me the ball. This is not what I do here, right? They know their separate roles and they do not mix. So we have to be really, really cognizant that we're not doing that either with guys. We can do more videos on this. We have done more videos on codependency. So I'll wrap it up on that topic here. The reason we have to kind of get that out of the way, because now I want to talk about the nerd thing, right? Oh, nerds. Okay, let's define nerd, geek, and dork, because I've been thinking about this. This is what I do with my time. <clears throat> I feel like nerd is an overall umbrella. Geek to me means like, Someone who is very hyper-focused on one thing. Like I'm a Harry Potter geek. I'm a Lord of the Rings geek. I'm like a science geek, a furry, whatever. You know, a dork to me is like they're socially awkward. And maybe they have all this cerebral, cerebrality, is that a word? Cerebralness to back it up, but maybe not. Maybe they're just a goober. You know, like a dork and a goober, like the Duggar family, they're dorks. But they're not geeks and they're not nerds. They're not smart enough. They're just weird dorks. A nerd is someone who is like, like that's the overarching umbrella. Like if you're, well, no, because a dork isn't always a nerd. Okay, so a nerd to me is just like, you're just cerebral. Like you're not a clout person. You're not like going for like life on the gram. You're just, you're much more intellectual, you know? And I see John Mulaney as a nerd, right? He's not like the flashy guy. Like he's like, come on. Olivia though, actress Olivia Munn, God, where do we even begin with her? Okay, so she she came up hosting um, like that gaming show, Attack of the Show. Why was it called that? On like the E3 network? I don't know. I'm like not an adult virgin, so I'm sitting around playing video games. And her whole shtick was like, I'm the hot geek. <laughs> I'm just like so quirky. <laughs> My boobs are amazing. Oh, <laughs> but I'm like so quirky, but I'm like super fucking beautiful. But I'm like quirky. And my friends who've like done hosting, you know, I was, uh, I've done hosting stuff a lot. And my friend's like, she's a fucking hack. Like, she's not even good at it. She doesn't really know about geek stuff, but she's not, she's just whatever. Every movie I've seen her in though, I've really liked her. I think she's really funny. And she is like a smoke. Although now she's got like this weird plastic surgery. Like her face to me looks like every other chick in Los Angeles. And I really, I really liked her face. Like I really liked her like OG face, but okay, whatever. She also though, seems like a real kind of climber. She does. She just seems like kind of a schemer and a whatever. And look, I'm a predator. Like, can't knock the hustle, girl. I see you. But I do see her. Like, there's something about her. She seems like there's a lot of machinations to how she operates. Like, anadermis, anadermis. Like, I just think she targets people. So this brings me to how her and John Mulaney met in church. Girl, really? Listen, listen. I know that this is like the cool thing in Hollywood to like love Jesus. I'm not saying that she's not like authentically religious, but I'm actually saying exactly that. I'm sorry. I'm saying exactly that. I am saying I could very easily picture her going to church, like with her head on a swivel, looking for other famous dudes. Like, holy, oh yes, I 
You get all the way up. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh huh. Holy. Yeah, that's fine. Do you know his name? Can you introduce us? Met at church. Again, I can't knock the hustle. This is a great pivot. When you have a guy who's fresh out of rehab and he's like, I want to live a clean life, I want to be healthy. And in a lot of rehabs, they talk to you a lot about God. Give it to God. The Lord has the same, whatever. So he could be kind of like in that tract already. And if you're like, I too am a child of God with my perfect fits. Like, okay. Okay. So she could be representing shadow selves. She could be representing what most nerds want is to get the hot chick and not just the hot chick, the hot chick who Oh my gosh, actually, underneath it, she's really nerdy and cool too. You know what we just call that around here? You know what we just call that? A smart woman. A, just, a, just a smart bitch. Like, I am super nerdy and like dorky. All of you guys are too. You know why? Because we're simply intelligent. And yeah, like we, we know how to do our hair and our makeup and like our tits are perky and our asses are beyond reproach. But I just, there's something about Olivia that's just very pick me. It just feels very pick me. I don't, do I have evidence to this? No, it's just instinct though. Like, you know what I mean? Does it, do you guys feel like this? Or you're like, no, I love her. And I'm not saying I don't, but okay. So they met at church. Now we're going to switch point of views. Okay. We, we were on team Anna Marie talking about things from her point of view. Now let's look at it from Olivia's. Let me just zip myself into the suit of someone who is super into her vibe. Give me a second. Okay. So she has priorly dated like some beefcake dudes like Joel Kinnaman and then Aaron Rodgers. And I know a lot of you guys are like, she was a beard for Aaron Rodgers. The homeboy is gay. Okay. Let, for just the sake of this. Okay. Let's say that he's not, let's just say that's cause that's a whole separate story. And it really, it doesn't relate. She's dated like the jock, like the cool guy, you know, the, the dude ever girl wants to fuck. Like she's dated that. And now she's dating the nerd right? We have been there. And you know, when we go there, well, the best case scenario is when we realize what matters and what doesn't. When we realize not just what we want, what looks good on paper, what looks good on Instagram, but what we need. Do we need the hottest guy in the room? Do we need the fit guy? Do we need the clout guy, Mr. Popular, the captain of the football team? Or do we want the guy who connects with us in a mind way? Who's like, no, he can't change a tire. Man, the tire weighs more than he does. But he can like talk me off the cliffs of insanity. He can expand my mind. We can sit and talk about philosophy. We connect in a way that other people might overlook in me. Because look, again, let's we're operating on the assumption that Olivia is both very nerdy and very hot. I mean, she's she's super smoky, but we are also this way, right? And it's natural for guys to react to us like how we look. I present, I mean, I live in Montana and I come out with like my fur and my like heels and my ba -ba -ba. like I'm very extra. I am. And so, and I, I mean, th that's just me though. Like I don't do it like on purpose. I don't do it to scare people away, but I mean, this is me. I'm not going to roll up to a bar and hunting camel. I'm just not, that's not me. And it's inauthentic. And so it's hard for me to connect with guys who can see like beyond the glam because guys are fucking dumb. They're like, they're like dumber dogs. They just, they can't see the nuances of women, whatever. So it's hard for me to find people to cerebrally connect to. So when I do, I feel very, very seen. I feel, I'm like, oh my God, he knows who Marcus Aurelius is. Oh my God, we can talk about space and, and whatever, science, just just nerd things, right? And so this is, the, this is the best case scenario. You go for the nerd because you need someone who sees you, whether that's your shadow self, you know, the part of yourself that you either can't or won't feel comfortable amplifying to the rest of the world. Maybe you've always been the pretty girl and it's like, I actually geek out to naval history and naval battles. And that's like not really that cool in your sorority. Or if you just have always been the nerd and you're like, yeah, I just, this is who I connect with. That's the best case scenario. Now, what is, what is the worst case scenario? You ready for this shit? Worst case? A little something I call the kill the cheerleader syndrome. Now we talked about this before. We talked about this a long time ago. We were, we did a video on Ed Sheeran and Post Malone. 
and talked about why ugly guys neg you. Because haven't we all been there? Where it's like, I'm sorry, are you, I'm sorry, are you, re are you rejecting me? And I use Ed as an example because he's like the king, he's like the ugly king of negging in, in Hollywood. He boned all of Taylor Swift's literal Victoria's Secret model friends and like humped him and dumped him, like never spoke to them again, negged them so hard. And here's why going after the nerd, what it could be the worst case scenario. When our egos need a boost, when basically we're using a guy and a nerd comes along, an ugly guy, a fatty, whatever, and we think, you know what? I am so far out of his league. He's just going to worship me. And honestly, I need the ego boost. So it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, no, let's go outside. And then you wake up or things progress and it's like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Are you ghosting me? You don't want a relationship with me. Did I hear, did I, did I hear that right? And then what happens next? A spiral that will last like literally for the rest of your life. I get so many messages from you guys being like this ugly guy. He's trash. He lives in his mom's basement. He's short. He's stupid. I cannot get over him because he doesn't want me. This is not your heart talking. This is your ego. The heart is actually pretty elastic. Your heart heals pretty fast. It's a very hopeful organ. Your ego isn't. Your ego needs are almost bottomless. When your ego gets bruised, it will last forever unless you have the tools to talk yourself out of it. And the tools is honesty. The tools are honesty. The tools are, okay, I should not have swiped on that guy and let him take me out and pay for an expensive dinner because I needed to feel pretty and I needed to feel needed. And on some level, he maybe knew that, that I was like using him either for an ego boost or whatever, or and we'll get to kill, kill the cheerleader. So look, I need to not use people. I need to not date when I'm emotionally vulnerable. I need to not assume that the nerd is just going to love me simply because he's a nerd and I'm hot. It's a fallacy that nerdy people have low self-esteem. That's definitely not true from my experience. If anything, the people who are the most classic narcissists that I've been involved with or, or met, oh, they're the nerds. They're the nerds because a lot of nerds, they grow up angry. They grew up angry that they are superior as they see it. <clears throat> and yet like, oh, Jackson on the lacrosse team is getting all the girls like Braden on the hockey team. Like they've never said anything remotely intelligent. Why don't girls like me? And this festers and it festers into this self-aggrandizing personality, into just this spitefulness that they go out into the world with. My mom always said that there is no one more dangerous in this world than a mean nerd, a nerd with power. Because then comes the syndrome. Then comes kill the cheerleader. What is the kill the cheerleader syndrome? It's when men basically, this is old Southern saying, cut off your nose to spite your face. You're doing things that are actively working against your own betterment and your own goals and your own happiness to just stick it to someone. A kill the cheerleader syndrome dude will have a beautiful, amazing smart, but also nerdy, just awesome chick in front of him. And he cannot help himself to dump her, neg her, ghost her, be shitty to her as revenge, basically for middle school, as revenge for being the nerd. There's a reason that movie series is called Revenge of the Nerds, because that's what all nerds want. Fucking revenge. Look at the show Big Bang Theory. Ugh, I, I maybe watched like four minutes of it one time. And I'm like, these are the most unlikable characters I've ever seen in my life. They're all mean and spiteful. There's an eh, like that the tall one was a Thurston Gordon. I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch this stupid show, but like the main one, like the, the mean guy, but he's like mean because he thinks he's better than everyone. And no one's like bowing down with this slavish obedience to worship him. And so they move through life angry and mean. So listen, girl, if you think going after the nerd is like a guaranteed W, you're going to get a big old win out of this. He's going to love you and cherish you and value you. More often than not, <laughs> that's not how it goes, especially if you're coming at it from the wrong reasons, if you are only dating him because you want to be adored. But you know what? It can obviously go right. If you guys really are connecting in a mind meld thing, that's great. But then things can also go left because at the end of the day, 
like I said, I am nerdy, but I'm also extremely socially fluid. I know how to work a room. I'm charming. Like, I'm sorry, I am. I know what I'm bad at, math, but I know what I'm good at, and I'm good at people. And for a nerdy guy to be around someone like me, it can just throw a spotlight on everything he's not. And then you become, like an Anna Marie, another repository of the worst parts about himself. Are men not just such trash? Are they not, like, they're so confusing and so simple at the same time. They're like a, like a horrible toddler trying to tell you a story about a fire hydrant they saw and you're like, please make this stop. Why am I trying to decipher what they're saying? Because it, it doesn't even add up to anything. What am I doing here? This is awful, right? Men are ruled by their ego. We say we get our ego bruised and it lasts forever. I mean, we're ruled by our hearts, you know, in our head and sometimes our vaginas if we're drunk. Men, it's like ego, 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 ego. So if they are fundamentally pissy that they're not like the cool guy, it's going to be an uphill battle to date them. But like I said, even if they, if you guys do connect in this mind meld way, it might just be constantly very difficult for him to be around a woman who is the hot chick. He might not know how to deal with other guys wanting his girlfriend. And we always think like, well, doesn't every guy want that? Every guy wants to date the chick that like other dudes want. No, they don't because their ego can't take it. Because if they feel fundamentally like not attractive, why is she with me? Having guys hit on her is just like going to make them insane. It's like, well, eventually she's just going to leave. So where have you been? Who are you actually out with? Who are you texting? You can get a nerd, an ugly, a fatty, a dumpy, who's like really controlling. It's like, who the fuck do you think you are? And then we start to kowtow to them. It, there's a lot of ways it can go bad. I'm not saying date like the jock, like the dumb jock. I mean, go for the nerd, but buyer beware. You know, what I am saying is do not think that just because he's not like the cool guy who's like fucking every girl in Bozeman, that he's going to be Prince Charming. We have to evaluate people on a case to case basis. When we go into dating thinking, well, if they're blank, then this is a hundred percent going to work out. If they're tall, if they're rich, if they're Catholic, if they're a nerd, if they're also ready to have kids, then this is 100% going to work out. It's not that simple. We have to pull back and look at the nuances. We start doing that by really understanding where we're coming from in terms of dating. Why are we dating a nerd? Ooh, ah, my ST. Why are we doing this? Is it for the right reasons? Is it maybe for the ego-driven reasons? Because that ego will backfire on you. And also remember that... It is not your job to dial down your shine to ameliorate the weak ego of a nerd or of a jock. Look, I don't want you dating the hot like jock guy and pretending you are dumber than you are. Oh, I don't even like understand what Bitcoin is. I know all about blockchain. Right? I don't want you doing that. And conversely, I don't want you like grubbing yourself up to make yourself a little bit more palatable for the nerd guys. Fuck that shit. Fuck that shit, man. You have friends who accept you for who you are. Glam and extra, but smart and empathetic and blah, blah, blah. You can find a man who does it too. Or you know what? Maybe we don't. Maybe our friends are our soulmates. And maybe guys are this fun thing on the side, like this in Sex in the City, right? And maybe we can accept them for who they are. And they can accept us for who we are, all of our individual shortcomings or longcomings, if there's something good, right? And not try to mold people into our mirror image. Like I said, just analyze why you're doing something. Don't be afraid to get out. If you feel like you have to change yourself in order to stay in this person's life, that is never the price of admission. I want to know your thoughts on John and Olivia. Do you think they're going to last? Is she just like the hot piece of ass rebound after divorce? His poor ex-wife. And what have you done with a broken man that fixed him? I have recently had to just like wash my hands of someone. I'm like, I can't, I can't watch this anymore. And also like me offering to help you clearly isn't helping. It's doing the opposite. So see you later, Shalligators.